This is a demonstration of my low-cost infrared motion tracking system built from scratch, which is able to provide room scale millimeter level positioning at a cost of only $20. The system uses four custom-built cameras around the room, each one only costing $5, to reliably track multiple infrared markers from all angles. Here you can see them giving a nice 360 infrared view of my dorm room. Using this infrared tracking system, we can localize drones inside my room to keep them in a steady hover, even allowing them to recover from major disturbances. This is the clip played again, with the tracking data shown in the bottom left, which was calculated in real time and sent wirelessly to the drone. The drone's PID controller could probably do us some tuning, but as you can see the localization is very accurate. Before we can start triangulating markers, we first need to know the positions of all of the cameras, which my system is able to calculate automatically. I'll explain this process in detail during the technical deep dive, so stick around for that. Here's a pretty cool demonstration of the system's accuracy, showing the high precision 3D tracking it's capable of doing. The system's triangulation is also extremely tolerant to occlusions of any camera's view, as you can see here. Each point only has to be seen by two cameras to be tracked, with each additional view providing extra accuracy. Even when positioning is completely lost, the drone is still able to seamlessly recover. The motion tracking system is capable of tracking multiple points at the same time. Here you can see two drones being localized, each one having three infrared markers. Looking at the raw camera view, you can begin to understand how hard it is to triangulate these six points when they are so close to one another. Now we're going to go into a bit of a deep dive into the technical parts of this project. Here is an overall architectural diagram of the system. Um, there are quite a few interconnected pieces, so it's honestly pretty amazing that it works at all. From a high level, the computer calculates the drone's position and transmits it to a microcontroller on the drone, which then corrects its angle accordingly. So we'll start first with the drones, which I think are pretty cool. They are super small and durable and use easily swappable 18350 batteries, which give it just under 10 minutes of flight time. They consist of an ESP32, which receives the data and runs a PID loop to try and maintain the drone's positions. This ESP32 then pretends to be an RC receiver and sends throttle and joystick controls to a flight controller board, which keeps the drone stable and executes joystick commands. Unfortunately, the only way to get the signal from the ESP32 to the flight controller is through this tiny pin, and since all of this is being done out of my university dorm, I didn't really have the right tools for the job, but it works well enough. As I mentioned, the ESP32 runs a nested PID controller. The outer loop converts the position error to a velocity setpoint, and the inner loop converts the velocity error to an acceleration setpoint, which is essentially a joystick command. This is then sent to the flight controller, which actually runs another PID loop, so there ends up being like three dozen PID parameters to tune, which is an absolute nightmare. I never really got it tuned properly, which is why you can see it oscillating sometimes. The drone position is actually being triangulated super accurately, it's just the bad PID tune making it not rock steady in the air. Next, we'll look at the computer side of the system, starting with the cameras. Obviously, the cameras are a very important part of this project. I use PS3i cameras, which can be bought online for literally just $1, and have frame rates of up to 150 frames per second, which is pretty incredible for the price. You can convert them into infrared cameras by taking out the IR cut filter and replacing them with an IR filter. Proper infrared filters aren't cheap, so I just used a piece of cut up floppy disk. Um, this one apparently used to have Doom 2 on it, but now it's going to be an infrared filter for me. Um, and as you can see, it lets infrared light through. Anyway, I also took out the cameras from its original shell and enclosed it in a 3D printed swivel mount and put an infrared floodlight on it so it can be used with retroreflective markers. So next we'll talk about the Python backend, which has quite a lot to do. Um, firstly, we have to locate the infrared markers from the video. Then we calculate the camera's positions in space, triangulate the 3D position of the markers in space, and then identify where the drones are, do some filtering, and then send these positions to the drone. So locating the infrared markers from the raw video is pretty simple. Uh, we just use OpenCV to isolate the bright points in the video. The next step is camera pose calculation, which is essentially figuring out where the cameras are located in 3D space. Unfortunately, we can't just whip out a tape measure because it won't be accurate enough. But basically what we're working with is something called epipoly geometry, since we have two or more cameras in arbitrary positions looking at the same object. So given seven points viewed by two cameras, we can actually calculate the relative rotation and translation between the two cameras. Um, we need to do this in camera pairs. 
So we first find the relative rotation and translation between camera one and two, then two and three, three and four, etc. And then doing this, we can figure out the relative position of all four cameras in space. There's a lot of complicated math involved in this process, and I would highly recommend watching this YouTube playlist from the channel First Principles of Computer Vision. It's an amazing resource, and me trying to explain epipolar geometry camera pose calculation would just be a very poor regurgitation of these videos. Um, OpenCV can help out with some of these steps, but a fundamental understanding of the math behind it is really useful and also just very interesting. Perhaps the coolest part of the camera pose calculation process is something called bundle adjustment. So the epipolar geometry camera pose calculation only gives you a rough estimate of where the cameras are. It could be off by a couple centimeters. This is manifested in something called a reprojection error. Basically two cameras will see a point and instead of their rays intersecting exactly in the same place, they miss slightly. And this distance between the two rays is something called the reprojection error, shown here in red. What we can do is run a nonlinear optimizer with our reprojection error as our cost function and camera poses as our parameters. This will slowly shift around the cameras, finding the most optimal positions for them to be in to minimize the reprojection error. It's honestly such a neat solution and it's really cool to see it converge on a solution. Now that we have all of the camera's poses, we can start triangulating the points. Finding the location of one point is easy. We're essentially just projecting the rays out from each camera and finding out where they intersect. And this can be done with something called the direct linear transform method. The hard part is when we have lots of infrared markers in our scene. How can we correlate the dots in camera one with the dots in camera two? To solve this problem, we exploit something called epipolar lines. Essentially, if we see a point in camera one, we know that its corresponding point on camera two has to be somewhere along this green line. This is because the point in camera one has no depth information. The marker could be here, here, or here. We don't know how far away from the camera it is. So therefore, the marker could be anywhere on this line in 3D space. So the image point projected onto camera 2's sensor must be somewhere along this green line, making our life a lot easier. Using this epipolar line, we find possible sets of image points which could correspond to each world point. We then calculate the reprojection error for each one of these sets of image points and choose the one with the lowest total error. This allows my system to be tolerant to some cameras not being able to see an infrared marker, or markers overlapping with one another and merging into one blob. Finally, now that we have our markers locations triangulated into 3D space, we can locate the position of each drone. So we need three markers for each drone to calculate its position and heading while also distinguishing the drones from one another. Take for example this drone. It has three markers in this triangle pattern, so we can simply scan through our world points to find this triangle. If we find multiple matches, we can then use the one closest to the current location predicted by our Kalman filter. These drone positions can then be sent to each respective drone wirelessly. The Python backend sends the data to an ESP32 blue tacked to my wall via serial connection, and then the ESP32 then sends the data to the drones via the ESP Now protocol. To control the whole system, I built a web interface in React which communicates to the Python backend via socket.io. The left pane of the front end allows you to tweak the camera exposure and gain settings, start triangulation, and enable drone tracking. In this case, the drone can be seen by two cameras, which the back end detects, so the front end displays the drone's position and heading on the map as a green cone. On the right here, we can input the set points for the drones, arm or disarm them, and change a bunch of parameters on the fly. This is especially useful for the nested PID loops running on the drones, which are an absolute pain to tune. The PID tune right now was honestly pretty horrific, as I'm sure you could tell when I was pushing the drones around, but it took a couple days of tuning to get it to this point, and I really can't be bothered to do more. In the middle, we have a motion planning section, which allows you to set the max velocity, acceleration, and jerk for each axis. You can then put in some waypoints and hit preview, and the motion planner will generate a flight path satisfying those constraints. Um, you can see here that if we relax the max jerk, the flight path looks different. This bottom pane is the real fun part of the front end. It shows you the camera's location in the room, the tracked points, and the drone's location. The chart on top shows you a bunch of metrics in real time, like position and velocity, which is very useful for PID tuning. Going back to the overall architectural diagram, you can see how many moving parts there are in this project, all communicating to one another with different protocols. It was quite an ambitious goal to create my own motion tracking system and fly autonomous drones all in one summer, while also working full time as an intern at Palantir, but somehow I was able to pull it off. Um, I probably won't do it again though, it was a bit of a pain. All of the code and 3D files for this project are open source on GitHub. 
Um, the code isn't very clean, but it's definitely a good starting point if you want to do something similar. I would also like to give a big thanks to Queen's College at Cambridge who helped fund this project. Before I end off the video, here's a short compilation of all the crashes I've had in the last few days while filming. Mm.